I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, who I'm so excited to have here. Um, Dr. Rachel Havelock is an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, who has written about and extensively researched the relationship between water sharing and peacemaking. You can correct me if any of this doesn't sound correct. In particular, as these ideas relate to the River Jordan and Israeli-Palestinian borders, as well as to the Great Lakes region. Um, she's also a Rhodes Scholar, which is another program at Illinois Humanities. Um, and if I understand correctly, uh, she came to, into her expertise and area of study um, that we're exploring with her tonight by way of her role as a religious studies professor. Um, so it only seems fitting to introduce her with a quote about water from a religious text. Uh, this is from the Quran. I just found it by Googling today. Uh, by the of water, we give life to everything. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Richard.
And as you'll see in a moment on the map, the Jordan River is a contemporary contested border. It's a recognized border between the state of Israel and the kingdom of Jordan, but it's also a contested border um, between um, the state of Israel and um, the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people. So I spent a lot of time, you know, sort of figuring out why is this river border, maybe we'll go to the next slide, um, so you can see what I'm talking about. So you can see the, the Jordan River there um, running through, going into, the, into the, the Dead Sea. So I spent a lot of time asking, why is this the border? And when I first showed up in the region and just asked people, everyone was like, oh, it's the border because of religion. Right, that's, those are the borders in the Bible, that's, those are the borders in Islam, it's a religious issue and we're fighting over God. So I spent a whole lot of time um, figuring out what were the religious borders, and I'll just get to the conclusion they aren't this. But everyone had kind of domesticated and claimed those borders as their religious borders. In a word, um, these borders come from the colonial era. Uh, they were drawn by British map makers um, as they were figuring out where the colonies after World War I would be. And I'm not going to give it away, we'll save it for another time. I'm doing some new research that actually these borders that we're looking at, including the, the borders of Syria that we're hearing about quite a bit, actually um, resulted from the planned path of oil pipelines. Um, so that's something I didn't know then um, that, um, that I know now. So these were the colonial borders, but everybody walked around saying these are our sacred religious national borders. So once I realized that that wasn't the case, I thought, is it just a tragedy that everybody's locked in to these ideas that these are their borders and only their borders and that there's no way out of this but national struggle. And I turned to the whole question, I was like, well, the Jordan River is a border, but it's also a river. So maybe if we've had enough of this, um, and I'm happy to go back to anything, uh, maybe we'll have the next slide. So then I was like, well, this is a river that, upon which people depend. It's a watershed. So how does the conflict and how does place look differently when you don't think about a river as a dividing line, but actually as a shared water source? And amidst that question, I um, got involved with an NGO, which is the group who drew this map called Eco Peace Middle East. And there they are in a region of prolonged conflict. I'll give you the upshot. Um, this river you see here is now running at 4% of its historic flow. So that it's 4% of the water that's running through it. It's, it's reduced 96% and um, probably more. It is in that state partly because of climate change, but also because of diversion. Because when you have no apparatus of interaction with your neighbors, it means that everybody diverts water for themselves and doesn't worry about who might be downstream. So the Jordan River, right, sacred to Judaism, to Christianity, to Islam, this river that is a sacred body of water and um, with some of the oldest sites of civilization, um, in the summer months basically is just conveying wastewater um, because the diversion is so extreme. Mm -hmm. So Eco Peace Middle East is in an area with extreme diversion, with climate change. Um, something's going on around here um, of sinkholes. It's very Star Wars, mm -hmm. um, but kind of you know, um, more real, where um, literally at certain moments because of the, the destabilization of the ground, it will just like sink down into enormous craters. Um, so EcoPeace came to this situation and they asked a really basic question, who benefits when a river disappears, right? Who benefits when an entire watershed um, just evaporates? Well, of course the answer is hardly anybody, right? Certain kinds of chemical companies that don't have to drill, right? They can just scoop benefit. But in essence, 
economy, livelihood, sustenance, all disappears. And that's not in anyone's best interest. So EcoPeace came to the equation and they said, well, what if we um, start looking at the area as something that is shared by various nations? And so they created this map, right? What does a basin look like? The next step, um, let's see if I have that as the next slide. Oh, okay, the next slide is diversion. So wait, let's go there so you can see um, diversion. Okay, so here's the, um, the issue of diversion. Okay, I'm sorry, let's just go back one so we can kind of see um, this. So what they did is they um, found all of the communities that share a water source. And many of those, okay, actually let's go, let's go with a few, uh, a few slides forward if you would. I'm sorry, now it's going out of order. Okay, let's uh, go a couple more forward. I want to get to the good part. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna get back here in a second, but let me. Okay, this is the bad stuff. Let's go back to it. Um, here's the good stuff. Okay, so part of uh, what EcoPeace did is they created this program of good water neighbors. So they found communities that share the same water source. And they engaged community leaders, educators, mayors, community leaders, youth. And they sent those people out to look collectively at what were the challenges to their source of water. Right? What is the source of pollution? Where is the diversion <coughs> happening? How could they sustain their communities in the long term? How could they sustain their communities in the short term? So they brought everyone together to research together. Well, if their water source was polluted, what was the source, right? If something was being managed well, who was doing it? And they started simply bringing people together to investigate and think about something that affects everyone's life. And it was not um, easy to, to get that going because suddenly you had Palestinians working with Israelis, Israelis working with Jordanians, Jordanians and Palestinians, there's even tension there working together, and some people in the community would be like, you're a traitor, right? you're crossing the line, we're at war with them, right? how could you do that? What about history? And what ended up happening, because the effects of the good water neighbors have been so tangible, that actually people became their own advocates. And so this means that, for example, some of the mayors and community leaders who are Israeli have gone to the Israeli parliament and advocated for greater water allocations to Palestinians, right? A, a group of youth have gone to the Jordanian parliament and said, you can't just put <coughs> off this kind of water planning. So actually, this very hyper-local organizing ended up having effects on a national level, and then you know some of these good water neighbors have also um, gone on missions to um, to other parts of the world. So it's a very, very powerful paradigm. And what I found in my own work is that it was one that went against the grain of the legacy of colonial boundaries that tried to divide people by ethnicity. Right? That this idea is like. No, we're actually not living on the other side of a line from people of a different ethnicity. We're all sharing the same space, right? The same water right here. So before we go back to the, the bad stuff, I just want to point out a little bit of what's going on um, in this map. Um, this uh, town, Abbasan, is in the, um, the occupied and embattled Gaza Strip. And in the 2014 war on Gaza, um, most of the communities there had no access to water. Their water access was entirely cut off. And the Israeli government, for example, was not providing them with water. Well, here's their good water neighbor. And they also have these good water neighbors in, around the area. They created um, trains to convey water to that community. So all of the members of the Good Water Neighbors said, no, we know those people. You can't call them terrorists, right? We actually know them. We've been working with them for years and years. And it was a very, very powerful paradigm of crossing borders. So 
<coughs> just to show you, you know, some of the, the more famous places, you can, you can see up in that area, the different neighborhoods of divided Jerusalem are suddenly working together and they found that one of the major contaminants of their waters are the tanneries. And tanneries always leach all kinds of chemicals into people's drinking water. So those communities together did the research, found scientists, <laughs> did it, and they've been um, advocating for that. Okay, so here's the good news. Um, but just to, to kind of um, go back a few slides, if you would, here. Um, yeah, a couple more. Okay, so we saw diversion. So diversion, um, of course, is an issue in water scarce areas. Diversion's a huge deal in California. We right now in the Great Lakes don't have a big diversion problem. Um, but just to start to draw these parallels, I just want to point out, especially for our discussion, that diversion can be a real problem. And it's uh, important as we start to think about what being in Chicago and being in the Great Lakes region might mean in the future. Um, it's kind of important to think about when national governments or maybe even more dangerously private companies um, start deciding to divert water and some of those issues. So just to, to kind of get to that, we can go to the next one. Um, okay, so the other um, big issue about Jordan along with Diversion is part of being in a border zone means that there's not a lot of oversight. And on the one hand, if any of you should ever want to come and work on this peace park that I'll tell you about in a moment, you can see that part of being a demilitarized zone means that things have been allowed to grow kind of wildly, but it also means that there's no oversight about dumping and wastewater. So most of what is flowing in the summer months through the lower part of the Jordan is um, untreated wastewater. And this gets really scary because uh, both in Palestine and in Jordan, there are um, sites, baptismal sites, where thousands upon thousands of tourists come in the summer months, right, for this experience of spiritual cleansing. Those people currently in the summer are being immersed in a kind of a 21st century um, conglomeration of pollution. So, um, yeah, there's the, the, the pollution issue. And here, would you go once more? Okay, um, let's keep going, because we got to this. Okay, um, yeah, let, let's go one more. Okay, this one is, is a bit of a fuzzy slide. I'm sorry, I was very nervous making a PowerPoint for artists. <laughs> you don't know, it was like the, the whole weekend. I'm like, oh no. Um, so please excuse me, um, what can I say? Um, <laughs> Um, this is a fuzzy slide, but, but I wanted to show it to you um, because this was an advertisement um, about a desalination plant in Israel. The Israelis have pioneered the world's best desalination, right? How do you take seawater, use um, minimal energy, but still a lot, and produce drinking water out of it? Um, it's kind of seen these days as a sort of silver bullet and what's been going on and why this matters not only for there but also for here is that these technologies are being accelerated in California right now. It's sort of the solution, right? What are you going to do about the drought in California? We've got the sea. We'll just create drinking water from the sea. I want to say a few things about that from the outset. And the first one is, is that it takes a lot of energy to take salt water and turn it into drinking water. Right? It's only oil or coal that ultimately can separate the salt from the water. You've got another question after that, which is then what happens to the salt? Right? It's not a minimal amount of salt. Like Where does that salt go? Does it go back in the sea? Does it go on land? Right? What's, the outs what's the outcome of that? But the real question, um, and how this matters globally, is that building a desal plant takes a whole lot of capital. And you might have noticed, like in our state of Illinois, there's no budget, right? We working for the state know this all too well. So we're at a time when states and municipalities are cash poor. So to start doing something like resell takes a lot of money. Who do you think puts it up? Corporations. 
right? And so when you invite, and there's about three of them, surprise, surprise, that do this globally. So the minute that a corporation is invited in to start creating water for people in a place, it suddenly means that the water in that place is no longer the commons of the people, right? The minute that a corporation is producing your drinking water, however they're doing it, whether it's filtration or desal or recycling water, the minute that they come in, the water no longer belongs to the people. And so it's really, really an important moment because the silver bullet argument is made all over the place. Don't worry, West Coast, right? We will start desal. But wait a second, West Coast, the minute that desal happens, it suddenly means that that water source, even if it's the Pacific Ocean, is no longer part of the common good, right, under the jurisdiction of the people living there. If we have, as, as we do in this state, many cash poor municipalities that have aging pipes and bad water filtration, and we enter into that partnership, it suddenly means that those water sources move farther and farther away from being ours. Now, maybe people think that it's worth the trade-off, right? Maybe they think the delivery of drinking water is worth it not belonging to the common good or not being under people's jurisdictions. I, myself, and who's ever asking me, am actually fine with that. However, the way that water gets sold in this day and age is that it gets sold by certain politicians in a one-time deal, and that currently, almost nowhere in the world is there any apparatus for a group of people living in a place. And that living in a place is very important because I think that when it comes to resources like water, the category of citizenship is insufficient. Right? One thing that capitalism has done has, is that it's created tremendous movement of goods and bodies over all kinds of borders for all kinds of reasons. And so that we have people that are living in a place. Those people living in a place depend on certain resources like water, and part of the argument of the freshwater lab that we're making is that those people also have a key stake in what happens to those resources. So as for me, right, if a group of people ends up deciding that it's worth their while to sell off their water source because they want the delivery right now, that's actually as a decision of the people would be fine. But we're very, very far from having any kind of citizen, not to mention resident, involvement in those questions. So here's a, was this bad, you know, kind of pixelated advertisement for um, this wastewater plant. Can you sell them over because I can't see your beautiful eyes, thank you. Okay, um, would you do the next slide? Yeah. Move over right here. You're blocking my. Right. Perfect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So that D's. Oh, would you just go back one more time? Yeah. Just, oh, no. Okay. Sorry. Go. Yeah. Uh, oh, we're going the wrong direction. Go forward. Uh, no, the other way. No, the other way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, next one. Fine. Uh, no. Okay. So um, this map doesn't show it, one of mine does, I'm sorry, but basically that world's greatest desal plant is right here. Okay, here is Gaza, which go to the next slide. Uh, the next one? Okay, next one, okay. Um, there you go, okay, so there's Ashkelon, so there's the world's greatest um, desal plant, according to the advertisement. Here's the Gaza Strip, okay, now the next one? Okay, so that world's greatest desalination plant is um, next to what's called the coastal aquifer. What we are um, slated to see in 2016 is one of the world's first um, aquifer collapses. The um, coastal aquifer in the Gaza Strip that sustains about 1.8 million people is about to collapse. It's about to collapse because of overuse. It's about to collapse because there is no um, centralized water system in the Gaza Strip, so people just drill down for water. When you drill down for water and you live by the sea, all the salt water leaches in. So nobody yet knows like what this means. Like What does it mean when close to two million people who are technically in global terms refugees end up with no water? 
And so these two things, it's just to show you that they're literally going on next to each other. Right? The corporate production of water at a desal plant is literally next to a place where people have insufficient drinking water. And that's partly why I would say that the privatization of water doesn't really end up as a silver bullet. Right? Even when it solves some people's problems, it tends to leave many people out of the equation. And what's especially strange to me is even if I were, or if I to put my mind, my head in the mind of a corporate manager, if you are um, conducting desalination in one place and an aquifer collapses, it also means that like all that waste of two million people goes out to sea, and surely that's also going to go into your intake. So you know, we're kind of really seeing these two dramatic movements um, simply um, right uh, next to each other. So the aquifer keeps the waste from going into the water? What does it do? Oh, the aquifer, I'm sorry, yeah, the aquifer is the water source. So there's different ways where we get our drinking water. We, oh lucky people of Chicago, right, are on the shores of Lake Michigan, which really matters, and it really means that, like, we're gonna matter. Both us as individuals and we of this place are gonna matter a whole lot, because we've got, you know, one of the world's biggest stores of fresh water right there. Um, other communities draw their drinking water from rivers, places that are near rivers. Other places have underground sources. So an aquifer is simply like an underground like spring or lake or river, but it's underground. So how does it collapse? It collapses because, right, if you think about if, um, like, there was unstopped pumping out of Lake Michigan, right? If we, like, pumped and pumped and pumped, and there was unregulated drawing, and there was unregulated dumping, um, and there's a finite amount of water but there was no kind of plan of how to distribute it. That coastal aquifer, you know, was simply never set up for the kind of population that you have right now. Plus, um, many water sources, whether above ground or underground, because of climate change, are kind of shrinking anyway. So it's like the perfect storm, right? It's a perfect storm, but what it means, like we really don't know yet. Like it's so close. What it means right now is that people draw their water from it, and um, there are a tremendous amount of waterborne illnesses. You know, like almost everybody probably is carrying one. But like, what it's going to mean in real terms, like wait and see, right? I mean, we're yeah, we're going to see this. Um, okay, so I, I did. Um, I meant to give all the bad news first, and then go to the good news. But, but um, you've heard some of the good news. Um, let's let's go forward past the slide. Okay, so we'll go forward. Okay. So you saw the, um, the Good Water Neighbors plan back there. So part of what that is about is literally having people active in a space who start asking these questions and thinking about it, right? What are the threats to our water? What's the future of our water? Can our water sustain us? Is it a good idea to bring in corporations to produce the water for us, right? So part of what that Good Water Neighbors is, again, is bringing people together across religious, national, and ethnic boundaries to ask those kinds of questions. And they, again, um, are in a state of war. The kind of really inspiring piece that um, we've been working on is this whole idea of creating a kind of center for the restoration of water, the gathering of people, and a reimagining of space as part of a shared commons. So I just want to show you some of the slides for our project of creating this cross-border peace park at the Jordan River. Um, so that's where it is. You can see it poised there. Um, go to the next one. And this is um, how um, the place once looked. So these are archival photos when the water was at, um, I believe there it's at 93% of its historic flow. So part of the idea is to create a site where um, diversion would be redirected, and if we can go to the next one, and um, to make a space in a border zone where people from all of the countries as well as tourists could come and meet and stay. And so here's um, kind of a map of, of what we're working on, um, taking these old worker bungalows and turning them into eco lodges. Um, 
there are um, this, this uh, old hydroelectric plant, and you can see the slide of Bauhaus train station that were um, built uh, in the 1920s that are just left there as abandoned structures. So this whole project is about engaging the local communities up there in the north in the valley. They tend to be um, very economically challenged. So kind of working with the communities on the design and the development of actually a kind of Jordan River tourism that would benefit the people living there and also um, give a chance for visitors to, um, to um, interact with that. And I'm happy to talk about this here, this more after, but it's been really exciting. In uh, more quiet times, there have been gatherings of artists and designers and different people there working with local communities about how you might re-envision the space that's a militarized border into actually a, a trans border um, site. Rachel? Yes? Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's really so small compared to where we live. Yeah. What is that? How, much, how big is that? How big is that? Maybe it's the Peace Park? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm so bad that I can relate to the, like yeah. a park here or a couple of Oh, like how big would the whole place be ultimately? Um, yeah, I've, I've been in the site, like, um, how would you describe it? How big is it? You, you've, been on, um, you've been on the two sides. I've been in it a lot. How would you describe the dimension? Well, like, Half of Golden Gate Park. Uh, so you brought a San Francisco one. 3.5 miles. Okay. Or like five miles. Is that? It might be a little bigger. Okay. All right. All of Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. <laughs> but that's helpful because I yeah. was trying yeah. to relate it. Yeah. 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 How big it is. But it's it's pretty uh, significant. And you know, on the Jordanian side, um, it's still like right now an army base. So, you know, all these things are there. It's kind of really interesting, especially when we go on these workshops and we're like envisioning the future. And like we always have that moment of talking with the soldiers. They ask us and ask us. And some one time they, they wouldn't let me off the bus. And the soldier said, once a professor from Yale was let off the bus. And I was like, oh, I have to have a position at Yale to get off the bus. Um, <laughs> but other times, you know, the soldiers, but then you kind of say what you're doing. and. Um, a lot of people in the immediate area are really excited about it um, and really see their future in this because right now tourism goes kind of the way of corporatized water, right? It means people come to see the Jordan River, they stay in Hilton's and Hyatt's, right? They eat food that are globally produced and shipped in. So you've got all these people there at the Jordan whose families have been there for a long time. And they're very excited to be the ones who produce the food and are stewards of the water and the ones whose um, work can be part of a museum, like a you know, post-national border museum. So there's a lot, a lot of local energy. And um, significantly for this part of the world, there's also some support um, on, the, on the national level. Okay, so uh, here's a question. Oh, sure. Is there a to date picture you showed us with the 94% flow of the water, the archival picture? Oh, of the Jordan River? Yeah. Yeah, there is. I see, I don't have it in my PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see the comparison. I was yeah, um, yeah, I will maybe afterwards, if I can get online, I can, um, I can, I can get some of those, those pictures up. But yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, especially there's lines actually from those same colonial groups where they measured where the Jordan was in, um, in uh, 1880. And like, you, you cannot believe that the river ever was at that time. I mean, it's really, really dramatic. And, and actually, in American terms, we wouldn't even call the Jordan a river. I mean, the Chicago River is probably um, five times bigger at this point in time. I mean, so, and that is, right, one of the major water sources for the people living there. It's also all accelerated um, because of the influx of refugees from Syria, um, which we can talk about a little bit um, more as well. Um, but if we can for a moment, um, I could go on and on about this part of the world, but there's also something that really happened to me in working over there, is that there I was with the Good Water neighbors and thinking about the Peace Park and uh, out on a sabbatical, and I came back to Chicago. And I thought, wow, well, we've got a lot of water. 
and we've got stability. Like what, what's the scenario? How is water distributed and thought about and managed in our place and time? And so it's this kind of analogy comparison that brought us to the UIC Freshwater Lab. That's how we got there. So let's see the next. Um, oh, oh yeah, that's, okay. So those, anyway, this is, okay. So on the one hand, you've got a real grassroots effort thinking about the Great Lakes as a commons, right? The idea that the lakes are belong to, but maybe ownership isn't the right word, right? That the Great Lakes are on a continuum with the people that live here and are part of this um, common good. And in contrast to the Jordan River Valley, we um, have long-standing institutions that look out for the Great Lakes. Um, one of them is the International Joint Commission. There are Americans and Canadians and they have this jurisdiction over the water shared by the US and Canada. It's 100 years old, it's very stable, right? It's a, it's a very good institution. Um, more recently, the governors of the Great Lakes states um, signed this Great Lakes Compact, and the compact is a super important piece of legislation because it basically says that the water isn't going to leave the basin. Now, what does it mean? It means that based on that agreement, there cannot be a pipeline of water from Lake Michigan to the West Coast, right? It means that there's a limit, and the limit is the drainage. And the governors who signed it, actually, not to be partisan, um, but were all Republicans, what motivated it, we can talk about. But there is this piece of legislation. And so that says that says, although it's, I mean, as we see at the end, it's not uncontested, right, that other places in the world can't come and take the water. The compact, however, let's, let's go forward a little bit. I can't remember if I'm out of order. Though there are the Great Lakes, by the way. And ah, more importantly, this is the basin, right? This is what the Great Lakes Basin looks like. So if we're in that question of boundaries, that red line marks the limit of the basin. And what the Great Lakes Compact says is like, it's not going outside of here. The water is for the use of the people living here. There is a, a map of, from the International Joint Commission, these are the boundary waters that this commission of Americans and Canadians um, look over. Okay, let's go one more. Okay, let's, we'll go back to that in a minute. Okay, hang on, we'll go back to that in a minute. I want the bottles. Okay, let's, we'll go back to that in a minute too. Okay. Uh, However, the Great Lake uh, <laughs> Compact um, does open itself up to the soft drink industry and to the bottling of water. There's a special provision in that compact that says that um, bottled water companies do have access to the water of the Great Lakes. And um, from my best understanding of it, they have access to the Great Lakes without paying anything in. So it means that bottled water companies, and no matter what the label is, this helps you see it, um, bottled water companies are basically owned by three companies. It's Nestle, it's Coke, and it's Pepsi. And so, you know, what um, this compact does give them, so we might not be you know, yet piping our water to the American West Coast, but it does mean that Coke and Pepsi and Nestle can draw water from the lakes, bottle it without putting money back in, right? Sell water at a profit, and then who pays for recycling the bottles? And the municipalities, right? You see how that works? So the compact looks good from one perspective, but on the other hand, it does have this clause that opens itself up to the forces of privatization. Um, now, I don't quite think um, that Nestle is ever going to own Lake Michigan, but in this region, um, especially in bad economic times, uh, and especially in the state of Michigan, Nestle went in to really hard hit communities. They're like, oh, you can't provide uh, city services? We will put that money in and we'll just own your spring and we'll just take your wastewater plant. 
So there is, you know, and it's pretty global, but it's also hyper-local, um, in which waters are being privatized um, by, uh, by bottled water. Okay, let's go back a little bit, just to the challenges. Um, so, yeah, here's a good one. Okay, so along um, with that issue of bottled water, so we've got abundance, you know, we've got um, good, um, pretty good uh, legislation. Another place where the Great Lakes really face a challenge is, is right here. Um, anyone ever seen this map before? So these are the pipelines, um, and only the oil, not the gas. These are the pipelines that run through our region right now. Um, these pipelines are bringing Canadian tar sands um, from that source in Fort McMurray um, to the sites of consumption in Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland. Now, just so you know, I mean, I actually didn't know this until I came back to the Middle East and started asking, Chicago's running on tar sands, right? We are no longer running on Middle East oil. We're not running on Venezuelan oil. We're running on this thick, heavy, oil that's like oil that looks like peanut butter that comes from up there in um, Fort McMurray. Those lands, the site of extraction, are First Nations lands. Um, those are sacred lands belonging to indigenous tribes. You think they've been paid? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's kind of unfettered um, extraction, and, and um, I'll let you guys know I'm bringing an artist who's been working with those communities on a digital storytelling site to Chicago in the winter. Um, and so it comes down this way. Um, see how uh, it's kind of, you can't quite see it on this map, but it also, the pipeline crosses underneath the Straits of Mackinac, where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron meet. It's a 75 year old pipeline. People have recently um, uh, dived down and taken photographs and video of the zebra mussels on it. Like, it is a really old pipeline with really, really toxic material that's running through our drinking water. It gets even more local. Um, anyone know our, where our refinery is? Whiting, Indiana. Okay, so that is, um, that's the refinery that serves Chicago. It was retrofitted about um, eight years ago to be a refinery entirely for this heavy, dense um, tar sand. One other piece of it is that, you know, to send something that looks like peanut butter through a pipeline, you've got to put, push a lot of other chemicals through to liquefy it. So all that is coming in these pipelines that are close to and underneath the Great Lakes. In our case, it's going to Whiting, Indiana. Um, Whiting, Indiana, anyone know this? Hardly reported, had an oil spill um, uh, in 2013. So again, we've got this whole system of oil running alongside and under our water source, and we don't know. Now again, some people, when I bring this to them, they challenge me. They're like, well, you like energy, right? You use it, don't you? And we do, and I'm not denying that. Um, but it comes back to this whole question about creating some kind of venue where the people who live in a place can have this information and can be part of the decision-making process. And sadly, we're simply at a place where the politics around it aren't transparent, or the decisions that are made don't reflect kind of the common good. And so, um, oh, let's go, let's just get one more piece of this, but I don't want to miss it. Uh, no, I go ahead and go the way you're going. To the, yeah, okay. So another piece, just to make it hyper-local, just as, as in the Middle East, um, the poorest, most disenfranchised people pay the highest price. I mean, most of the people, not everyone, but most of the people in Gaza are disenfranchised refugees um, living in very poor conditions. It's not really any different, I mean, although we're not looking at aquifer collapse, but of course, right, the greatest cost of environmental contamination is um, born by the most vulnerable marginalized communities. And so those communities by the refineries, for example, um, we refer to them as frontline communities, right? They are the ones who are right there, right? Whose immediate water sources are contaminated or run the risk. And they are the people who have the least voice in all of this, right? When decisions are made about oil processing, those are the voices we don't hear. 
And those voices are disproportionately low-income communities of color. And there is, right now, the way that the whole water management works, and I brought everyone together and had them meet their Middle East counterparts uh, <coughs> last spring in Chicago. And really, I mean, there's pretty much one type of water manager, whether at the state, um, national, or city level. And you know, this is certainly like you know, nothing against the people, but they tend to be um, all men, all white, and all trained with an engineering degree, right? They, and they represent, they've got knowledge, but they represent one constituency. And so here, just to show you, uh, part of having that, uh, that refinery in Whiting, Indiana, means that this, um, it's called petroleum coke, it kind of looks like a form of coal. It's used you know, for electricity and heating, but it's made of petroleum. There are these stacks of pet coke um, here uh, on Chicago's south side. And the pet coke literally, like pieces of it come out in the wind and are part of the daily um, air intake and water intake of people who live in those communities. And the pet coke is stored on the south side in Detroit, right? It's right in downtown Detroit from the most disenfranchised communities. So the people that are bearing the weight of this and um, also the health of it are people who have no public needs. Okay? So um, there is comes the idea of what about us becoming good water neighbors, right? What about mobilizing these different communities and neighborhoods and skills? Right, not based on expertise, but based on a local leadership model. And we started to bring, right, not only to listen to these communities, but to start to bring people together to be one another's advocates. Right, I'll give you a very concrete example. One of um, Mayor Emanuel's big agendas is Chicago River revitalization, right? Millions of dollars in downtown. It's kind of cool, it's mostly good, right? That's like, let's go enjoy the river. Um, <laughs> however, right, you've got um, downstream communities, like in Little Village, for example, that are sitting on the most toxic stretch of water in all of Chicago, and they're not in the plan, right? So we mm. clearly see we don't need to be at war, and we don't need to have massive scarcity in order to kind of take the mobilization um, around resources to heart and to really build constituencies and coalitions in that way. Because guess what? Um, let's, let's get some Great Lakes map. I don't know if it's before or after. Okay, well, here, well, oh, wait, oh, that's a good one. Oh, wait, okay, let's go back a little. Uh -huh. Can you go back three? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Oh, wait, did you see the Nestle CEO quote? Wait, I can't, how can I go past that? Uh. Okay, this was the Nestle CEO. Oh. Yeah. He said this publicly. Access to water should not be a public right yeah. um, when they, he was challenged by, um, by um, residents in Bolivia about the privatization wow. of their water. Okay, so let's go back to the map of the Great Lakes for a moment. Uh, sorry, Lo. Right there. Okay. Um, so um, here, again, you see the, the Great Lakes again. This, they represent one-fifth of the world's fresh water. So this is to say the world's coming, and they're coming soon. Um, places with no water, bottled water companies, um, the energy companies. I forgot to tell you who, of course, um, owns the pet coke plants. The it's coke almost like, yes, right? And it's not almost like ironic, insane play of words. The Petco storage facilities are owned by the Koch brothers. Um, so it's like, yeah, I mean, I, what else can we say um, except um, that? So whether it's the energy industry, the bottled water industry, um, people simply in need of water, there is a positive spin of this. I was saying to Jane, like Lagonitas Brewery, right up in left California. <laughs> so like, you need good water to brew beer. Um, so you know that's one of the businesses that's already moved this way, and they came with consciousness. They partnered with Alliance for the Great Lakes. That some of their profits go to the long-term um, maintenance of the health of the Great Lakes. Um, so there's a positive example. But whether in the form of climate migrants. Um, or privatizing companies or countries in need. Like the world's coming here soon. On one hand, to build the strength, right? The agreement with Canada is pretty good. Canadians are a little petroleum crazy these days, but we've got a good binational 
um, organization, but we sure don't have that on the local level. And I can say, you know, having met them, not that they're without knowledge or skill, but we have insufficient leadership around this. I think that if anything that I learned from the Good Water Neighbors is that this really has to be a grassroots effort and that it has to be um, one of the ways that people reach out to their neighbors and think about what it means to be a good water neighbor and that that kind of organization, I mean, as I've seen in, in the case of Israel and Palestine, that is an intractable conflict. And it is really hard for, those, for Israelis and Palestinians to even sit in a room together. But when it comes to the health of their water system, what's going to happen to their bodies, their livelihoods, their families, and when they realize they can trust each other on that point, they stay there, right? It's, it's 20 years um, that that has lasted. So the relationships that are built around water sharing are incredibly powerful and resilient. And so I think that it can be a mode of healing in Great Lakes cities, um, as well as being um, kind of a, a long-term um, point. And again, this was, um, this comes out, so, you know, I, I'm not the, of course, we at UIC, we're in the Freshwater Lab, we're not the only ones to be thinking about this, but we might be the most um, public ones. This comes from um, a big project done by the architecture firm Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Is there anything that might concern you about this slide in their study? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they did this whole study and this whole envisioning of the Great Lakes but it, it was funded by a Chinese company. Um, so you suddenly think, I mean, this is again, nothing against like the Chinese, maybe Chinese companies, certainly not Chinese people, but suddenly you're like, huh. So they were commissioned to do this comprehensive study um, for um, private interest. But here was just to show you one of their um, things that they looked at were what they called areas of concern. Now, I, I just want to point out um, quickly, there's more to say, but you know, they're the really deep one. Uh, it's my hometown of Detroit. Um, so of course, like, you know, again, environmental concern and toxicity, it clusters exactly around other forms of oppression. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's not like, oh, why? I mean, I think sometimes the environmental movement, it can seem, or the water movement, it can seem like a side interest like when there's so much violence and so much poverty, right, and so much displacement, like I'm going to worry about bottled water. But in fact, what I'm trying to articulate with that is that um, healthy water and access is exactly a piece of the larger issues. And I do think, you know, I mean, again, this is like a hometown thing, but, you know, the greatest resource in a city like Chicago or like Detroit is this fresh water. And if it really is part of the commons, and if the people living there figure out how to use it for economic um, development, particularly sustainable development, it's a powerful way to re-envision, I think, also some of the political and economic um, injustices. Okay, so one last slide, which is both beautiful, but I, I do want to point out the caveat. So here was the final uh, slide in the Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill Great Lakes idea, right? Many people's one water. You think, great, like it does seem very good water. <laughs> uh, neighbory, right? They're like, it's great, we can be united, we've got a common bond, a sweet water soul. And then, beyond two nations, the lakes are a global resource, <laughs> right? So I don't point that out to be like xenophobic, um, but rather to, to point out that part of what it might mean to truly be a good water neighbor is to have, you know, in a way like an expansive um, reach, right? I mean, people are going to be coming here for the water, and I don't think that that's necessarily a negative thing. But again, I think if the decisions about who pumps, who extracts, right, who builds pipelines, um, who sets up petroleum plants where? If those decisions continue to be made with so little public information and public oversight, right, then we're kind of looking at a global resource that's globalized beyond its people. So, I mean, I, I really think as much as this um, notion of like basin-wide politics, of organizing around that 
common good, I think it is a kind of a worldwide movement, but I think it wants, like it's a hyper-local one, right, where people really have stakes in the place where they're from and where they live, and they build on that strength and envisioning what their place should look like. One more, one more, one more yes. quick thing, because I promised you like artist things. Um, so uh, one, one thing, um, uh, I uh, went to this after oil university with all of these people in Canada in August, and there were a lot of artists there presenting about some of the things that they did, and we can talk about it more. But one thing that really struck me. Um, was an artist uh, who goes to coastal areas and works with people living in neighborhoods, and sometimes in housing projects, to kind of create this beach art, um, these things that are on the lakefront, or you know, in our case it would be the lakefront. But when I came back from that, I kind of hearing these different projects that are about community interface with water, and I started going to the beach. It's like, you know, we really have all this lakefront and we've got all this artistic talent, and yet we're not doing very much, right? When people are at the beach, there tends to be like a lot of trash, and there's not something there to help people connect with that water. I mean, the beach is great, I'm not saying don't go to the beach, um, I love the beach, but you know, there's nothing really there for people who are there to kind of think about what the lake might mean to them um, in these different ways. So I, I was just kind of thinking, like, why don't it not be a great city initiative to kind of get people going about making that lakefront, I mean, the lakefront's amazing, but about making that mean something to people and start building relationships um, with that water. So that was one little idea floating in my head I wanted to throw out uh, to everyone. I think that our first elective study suburb club artist challenge. <laughs>